One of the things I love about studying God's Word is as you read through it, you come across biblical characters that sometimes you kind of step back and say, wow. Uh, I think we all have probably some of our favorite characters or maybe some of those, those characters that the Bible doesn't say a lot alike, but it causes you to kind of step back and say, wow. And one of those characters for me is a man by the name of Enoch. There's really not a lot said in Scripture about Enoch. But when you look in Genesis chapter 5, I'm just going to read a little bit about what God says about Enoch. It says, Enoch lived 65 years, verse 21, and he became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I've often been blown away by what God says about Enoch. That there was such an intimacy with God and Enoch, that Enoch walked with God, and all of a sudden, Enoch was not, for God took him. Now, if it wasn't for Hebrews chapter 11, there would be a lot of speculation. What exactly does that mean? I mean, what what happened with Enoch? Well, if you go all the way over to the New Testament, to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 5 tells us, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And the very next verse, the beginning of it says, And without faith it's impossible to please him. To think that here God saw Enoch and there was such a relationship between God and Enoch that God said, Enoch, won't you just come on up to heaven with me? I would just want you to come and be with me right now. Now, you know, we live in an age of where the supernatural doesn't take place, and there are a lot of liberal scholars, and maybe you're one of those people today and say, really, Pastor, do you believe that? Yes, I really believe that. And I thought that, man, what, what would it be like to walk with God in such a way? As a matter of fact, the Bible says that it pleased God. That God looked at this walk that Enoch had with him, and it was pleasing to God. And my prayer for me, my prayer for you today, is for us to walk with God in such a way that it pleases him. So i got to ask the question. You know, I love asking you these questions. How's your walk with God? I mean, if you just look back this past week or just say recent history over the last few months, and as God looks at how you spend time with him and your relationship, how is your walk with God? Have you been walking with God? I think that's a great question for all of us. As we are going through looking at doing our part in the body of Christ, and we looked the last few weeks about how we've all been gifted and we all have our corner that that we need to to hold and taking our part. But I want you to understand that for you to be all that God wants you to be and for this church to be everything that it needs to be as we're doing our parts as individuals collectively to make the body The most important question you can answer this morning is that question, how is my walk with God? I I just wonder, what would it be like in this church if every one of us as individuals would walk with God the way Enoch was walking with God? Can you imagine what this fellowship would be like? Can you imagine what your homes would be like? Can you imagine what it would be like in the workplace if you would just walk with God in such a way that would please Him? And often we don't talk about walking with God. We, we come and we do our church thing on Sunday But we really don't think much about what does it mean for me to walk with God on Monday. When I get up in the morning and I wake up and the very first thing I say is, Hello, Lord. Let me start my walk with you today, Lord. And I want to walk with you the the rest of of, of the day. 
But for many of us, we get to some places and around some people and we leave the Lord at the door and we just as soon walk without him. So when I think about walking with God, it is actually spoke of quite often in, in, in the Bible. I want you to turn this morning because I want to lay out for you and, and, and for me, what does it mean to walk with God? I mean, it's God's desire that we do walk with him. We know that it is pleasing to him, but how do I do that? Well, in the book of Colossians, chapter number 1, it is Paul's prayer for the church at Colossae that they would walk in a way that pleased God. And I, as I look at verse number 9, that's where I'm going to begin reading this morning. Paul says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray that you, for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that you will, here it is, look at verse number 10. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously. Giving thanks to the Father who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. It, it, Paul's prayer for the church at Colossae was that, that they would walk in a manner that was worthy. That, that was not the only time Paul asked for this. Paul desired for the Thessalonians to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. He exhorted the church at Ephesus to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. The church at Philippi to the Philippians, he said, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Over and over, we see that it's God's desire that we walk in a way that's pleasing to him and walk in a way that's worthy. And that's weighty, folks. If we think about it, all of us would probably collectively say, none of us are worthy to walk. That's why this first point I'm going to make is so important. In order for this walk to start, there must be a starting point. If you go and you look in your GPS or you take your phone and you're headed to a destination, you always have to hit a starting point. There has to be a starting point in the journey. You know what your starting point in the journey in a walk with God is? It's accepting Christ as Savior. And for some, you say, well, that's obvious, Pastor. Well, let's start with the obvious in order for this journey to take place, for you to walk with God, the, for me to walk with God, there comes a time when I understand that I'm in darkness. And that's what he said right here, that all of a sudden we've been brought into this glorious light. We've been brought out of darkness. We've been rescued from the darkness of sin. We, we first must recognize that we're not worthy. That's where the worthy walk begins by saying, I'm not worthy. I can't do it. There's nothing good in me. There's nothing good in you. And all the, the goodness that we could collectively bring together would not bring one person in relationship to Jesus. But because of he taking us out of darkness, bringing us into his life, and, and notice that we've been transferred from, from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. And now we've experienced redemption. That's where it all begins. And so maybe you're here this morning and maybe you've never came to the end of self and realized that I need to, to ask Christ to become Lord of my life. That's where it all begins. You know, you're probably looking at your life now and, and things haven't been making sense and, and it just seems like there's one mess up after another mess up and it just keeps compounding. There's no hope. You're constantly discouraged. Because maybe you've, you've not come to the person of hope, and that's Jesus Christ. So it all starts with, with you coming and accepting Christ as your Savior. Well, as 
we begin the walk, we have to make sure that we're walking in the right direction. When you look at what Paul is praying for here, he asks that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. What does it mean to be filled with something? Hey, if you're filled with anger, that means you're controlled by anger. If you're filled with fear, you're controlled by fear. Well, Paul is saying, I want you to be controlled by the knowledge of the will of God. I want you to be in the will of God is what he is saying. Now this makes perfect sense for all of us. For, for us to walk with the Lord, we have to be in the will of God. So what is the will of God? You know, sometimes we talk about the will of God as if it's mysterious, as if we can't understand it. But it's not mysterious at all. I think there's three aspects that we can look at this morning to help you understand. If I'm going to be controlled by the will of God on this journey then the first thing I must understand is about the providential will of God. See, the, the providential will of God is basically this, that God is in control of all things. The first song that we sang, we talked about in the fast or in the feast, that God's in control. That whether things are good or whether things are bad, we have to know that God is in control of, of all things, that God takes everything and he works them together for his glory and our good that's why Paul said in Romans 8 verse number 28 for God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes so we understand that there are some purposes that God has for us in our life and God takes all the things that are happening around us and he works them toward his end and, and, and hold on to this thought because sometimes people struggle with the providential will of God. A great illustration is Joseph in the Old Testament. You remember Joseph with the coat of many colors? Remember Joseph and his dad had a great relationship. His brothers felt as if Joseph's dad was showing favoritism toward him so in their jealousy they went and sold Joseph into slavery he ended up in Egypt and you want to talk a man about a man who had a roller coaster of a life I mean he's in Potiphar's house he's elevated to a prominent position accusations by Potiphar's wife are made he's thrown into prison he gets out of prison and ultimately he's elevated all the way to second in charge of all of Egypt and then a great famine comes to his family. His family comes to Egypt and he comes face to face with his brothers. Now, I don't know what you would have done in that first exchange with your brothers that sold you into slavery. They put you through everything you have gone through. But there's great wisdom that Joseph gave us. He says in Genesis 50, 20, to his brothers... As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. See, Joseph understood what it meant to trust the providential hand of, of God. The book of Proverbs says that the mind of man plans his ways, but the God of the universe, God directs his paths. And we can come up with all these great plans, but we need to ultimately understand that God is the one that's orchestrating all of these things. And some things we just don't have control over. We just don't. But then there's the second aspect of the will of God. It's the moral will of God. What is the moral will of God? Well, when you go in the Old Testament, God gave ten commandments, ten laws, ten things not to do. And God gave these, and God wasn't trying to be a killjoy. He wasn't trying to rain on your good time in this world. No, God gave those Ten Commandments because he understood when we break those Ten Commandments, we hurt ourselves and we hurt people around us. And so we know that there's this moral law that God has, has given us. And you can look in the New Testament. The New Testament is filled with God's moral code of what to do and what not to do. And God says, if you're going to walk with me, you need to stay in the moral will of God. And you know this. Listen, you cannot walk with God and walk in sin. And, and, and you know, poor old God gets blamed for a lot of things in life. 
you're here this morning and, and, and maybe there's trouble in your family and the work and maybe it's a direct result of sin in your life and then you want to turn around and think that's the providential will of God that's causing this. No, that's you stepped out of the moral will of God. So maybe you're here this morning and you know in your heart that you've stepped away from the moral will of God because there's something in your life you know it should not be there. Or maybe there's some things you know that you should be doing that are not there and therefore you're still stepping out of the moral will of God. So we have the providential will. We have the moral will of God. But then we have what I call the, the, the special will of God. And that's the special will of God, again, that he's working in your life as an individual. You know this. We have physically been created unique in all ways from anybody else in this, this world. When we're saved, we're gifted in such a way. We've been given talents in such a way. And God has gifted us and given us those talents to walk in the special will of God. You see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Remember, how does the walk start? It's with a relationship with, with Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse number 8 and 9 tells us the gospel. It's God's grace. It's God doing on our behalf what we couldn't do for ourselves. Christ giving us his grace, giving us his goodness, giving us his righteousness. Now, as beautiful as verses 8 and 9 are, we begin to see the special will of God played out in verse number 10. For Paul says, for you are his workmanship. The word workmanship there is where we get our word poem or poetry from. That you are God's poem that's being written. For, for you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, Creating Christ Jesus for good works. And he did that beforehand so that you should walk in them. See, part of, listen, part of your being saved, God saved you. He brought you in relationship with him to walk with him. And at the moment of your salvation, there was this prepared plan that he says, now you need to walk in it. But it's not like a road map. That's, that's where we mess up. We think that, that it's like this map, and, and when we get saved, that God's going to give us this map, and we're going to see exactly where we're going to go and how we're going to turn out, and it's not that way. Listen, when God called me in the ministry, if he had showed, shown me the, the, the journey that I would have had to take in to get to this point, if he would have demonstrated and reveal to me all of the, the, the grief that I would experience when others lost loved ones and, and, and see the, the pain associated with loss of life. If, if he would have, have revealed to me how many families would be destroyed because of people's sin and the consequences of their sin, if he would have revealed all, if he would have revealed all the stuff that I have dealt with it may have been hard to walk in that road map. But you know what God said when he called me? He said, trust me. See, when Israel, when, when they were let go out of Egypt, God didn't give them a road map. You know what God gave, him, gave them? He gave them himself. He said, I'm going to give you a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And he says, and you've got to follow me. We, we just read on the screen about how God provided over and over and over, and it was a daily provision. And then all of a sudden, when the question of water came up, where did they, they stop trusting? They stopped trusting. And, and so here, here's the very first thing. In order to walk with God, we got to recognize the providence of God. There's this moral will of God, and there's this plan that God has, has devised for us. And it's not a road map, it's a relationship. It's a relationship. And so as he says that he prayed for them to be filled, to be controlled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Listen, the knowledge and control of God's will comes through wisdom and understanding. Here, here's, the, here's the next thing you need to understand about walking with God. You need to listen to him. 
listen to God. Now, primarily, how we listen to God is we, we, we read the Word of God, and through prayer, and, and through the Holy Spirit, listen, providing wisdom for us. The word wisdom that, he, that is used here it is the ability for us to accumulate and to organize the principles of Scripture in such a way that we begin to comprehend the truth. See, the only reason I can understand this truth is through the wisdom of God. And so to walk with God, you, you've got to begin to listen to God for his wisdom to be part of your life. Let me just say this. Some of the worst mess-ups in my life have come from trusting Brian's wisdom versus God's wisdom. See, see that's our mistake when we stop short. And, and it's one thing to read Scripture it's another thing intellectually to know what's there, but it's another thing to ask God to take it from just some intellectual knowledge to that of, Lord, give me wisdom in how to use this. But then there's the next part, there's obedience. That's the understanding. The, the understanding is taking the, the, the wisdom, the how-to, and actually put it to use. To start walking in obedience. It's one thing for, for me to, to know that I'm to love my wife. I know that. It's another thing for, for me to begin to read Scripture and understand, well, how do I suppose to treat her? Well, the Bible says I treat her as a weaker vessel. That doesn't mean that she's inferior and I'm superior to her. That just means that I'm there to protect her. That God's put me there as the leader of the home, and I'm the leader of the home. But he also tells me I'm to love her as Christ loved the church, who is willing to die and give himself up for her. So it's another thing for me intellectually to know, okay, I need to love my wife sacrificially. But it's a whole other thing to, to start putting that into practice every day. It's a whole other thing to realize when I'm making decisions and, and whenever the way I speak to her and the, the way I communicate with her, am I doing it in such a way that I'm walking with God? Am I treating my wife in such a way that pleases him? And am I walking in obedience in that relationship? And then go on and on in different areas of our life. You know, I, I know very well that I need, need to be, be slow to... Uh, speak and slow to anger and quick to listen. I, I know that. Well, well, sometimes I'm quick to speak and quick to anger. And so God wants us to, to, to walk in, in, in obedience. Well, it doesn't stop there. Because notice what he says. We, we do this in all spiritual wisdom and understanding as listening and obedience so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. And then all of a sudden, we need to serve him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is the reproductive aspect of the Christian life. Now, I don't believe it's just speaking of evangelism, but I think that's part of it. There's nothing quite like a good long walk when you got somebody with you. And, and God's intent, listen to me, God's intent for you as you're on this journey is to invite other people to go on the walk with you. That you introduce other people, that you are bearing fruit. There's this, you're reproducing yourself. You're a disciple of Christ. You want to create other disciples of Christ so that they can walk with the Lord. But there, there's also the fruit of the Spirit. It, it, Maybe you want to lie to yourself, but I promise you, if you ask the person probably on the road that you're seated on, if you ask them, if, have I been walking with the Lord this past week? A good way to do that is look at the fruit of the Spirit. And you can look at them and say, okay, this past week, did I walk in love? Was I really joyful? Was I peace, peaceful? Oh, here's a big one, patient. <laughs> How patient was I this past week? Kindness was... Was I kind? Was I gentle? Did I exercise self-control? See, when we serve God, God 
God expects us to serve. He expects us to bear fruit. That's part of the, the walking with him. But then as we, now let's stop, and let's just refresh what we've looked at. It starts with a relationship with Christ. That, that's where it starts. Then we make sure we're walking in the same direction. We look at the will of God. There's the providential will of God. There's the moral will of God. He has a special plan because I'm his workmanship. And that happens as I have this relationship with him. And day by day by day and moment by moment, he guides me. Then all of a sudden, there's this listening to him. I'm obeying him. I'm serving. And then all of a sudden, I have to trust him. That's what he means by strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Three different words he uses here to speak of strength, power, and might. Uh, the first two words, the root of that word is where we get a word dynamite from. Uh, it means inherent power. It means that all power resides in God and not us. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. We just sung that song. Did you mean it? It's one thing to say, it's another thing to live it each and every day and that we trust in the strength of God and the power of God and not our own power and our own strength. So there's this inherent power that God has, but it needs to be appropriated in our life. It needs to be used in our life. That's why he goes on and he, he says that according to his glorious might, the word glorious there is the word doxa, it can mean manifestation, manifestation of his might that God loves and desires for us to have his power and strength work through us. He must increase, I must decrease. We are strengthened in him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is his strength. And it comes down to trusting him. Either you're going to trust yourself in your power and strength, or are you going to trust God in his power and strength? Now, just as I have been prone to trust my own wisdom, I've tried to do ministry. I've tried to serve God in my own strength, in my own power. And guess what? It runs out pretty quickly. So many of you today, you're not trusting in God. But then you must stay in step with him. Now, don't raise your hand. I have, to, I have to ask the question. How many of you ever tried to run ahead of God? Wow. I think we all have. You, you may be in a place in life right now, providentially, God has you in this place, and you don't like it at all. But have you ever thought about this may be God's training ground for you right now? I mean, there have been places that I've had to go in my life that God has taken me on this walk that were hard. They hurt. But yet God in, was in the midst of it, and God said this is part of the journey. And notice what he is saying here. We have to stay in step with him for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. The word patience there deals with circumstances. Remember I just asked some of you in the circumstances, you don't like it at all. Let's go all the way back to this is where the providential will of God comes into reality in your life. Some of you do not like where you are in life right now and you're not being patient with God. You're trying to do everything you can to get out of the situation and God says, I have you right where I want you to be. Joseph? I'm sure when Joseph was having these false accusations made by Potiphar's wife against him, I'm sure in those moments he, he didn't, it wasn't enjoyable. But yet that's where God had him. When he was in, in prison and nobody would remember who he was, but yet that's where God had him. And God, God says that we need to be patient in the circumstances of life. And that's hard. But the word steadfastness, it's not dealing with the circumstances of life, it's dealing with people. <laughs> now, who, who are the people in your life that you're struggling with? See, I, I believe God sometimes places people in our lives that, that may be hard to get along with. 
There may be tension in that relationship right now. And God says, if you're going to walk with me, you're going to have to be steadfast in those relationships. You're going to have to be patient in those relationships. Moses, Moses, the great deliverer of the people of Israel, remember how patient he was in the circumstances of, of going to Pharaoh time and time again. Let my people go. Let my people go. The plagues will come. Let my people go. And finally, God let the people go. He was so patient in the circumstances, not always, but most of the time he was but what got Moses in big time trouble the reason he didn't go into the promised land is he became impatient with the people of God he wasn't steadfast in that and then finally to think if you're going to walk with God in, 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 in all the circumstances in life and all the people of life Do you have to walk in forgiveness? In verse number 14, it says, We have received redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Now, why is that important? Because I know who I am. You know who you are. I know how faithful and forgiving God is. I'm so thankful that he gives me second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, (laughs) seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth chances in life. And for me to have received forgiveness from God, how much more should I be forgiven to other people? It's one thing to to say that we're forgiven. It's another thing to live like we're forgiven, to walk in that forgiveness. So here you are. Go all the way back to the beginning. What does it mean to walk with God? I I think everything that we've looked at this morning, I don't think it's complicated. I I think if we as we begin to look, it's about that relationship with God that starts through relationship with Christ and his work on the cross on our behalf to to take our sin to give us his righteousness and as we walk in that direction and we got God working in his providential will we got the moral will of God we know that God has these special plans that he reveals day after day really it's almost moment by moment it's not the road map and God says you got to listen to me there's this wisdom you got to understand that's the obedience that's putting that into application. Then he says, I want you to be serving with me. I'm more, I, you need to be bearing fruit. Then you've got to trust me. Trust my power, not your own power. And then he says, oh, there's this thing called patience that you got to stay in step with me. Don't run ahead of me. Stay in step with me. And then we walk in forgiveness. Wow. So guess what? I love this about about how God uses his word and and in worship experiences like this, God right now is saying, you can walk with me. It's not too late. And, And by the way, if you are not walking with God, God's never moved. You're the one that's walked away. And God's calling you back this morning. Listen to me. Everybody listen to me. God's calling you back, and God says, I want to walk with you. And to think that when we walk with God, that it can please God, that's amazing to me.